Do the hearing testing features in the new Apple AirPod Pro 2 compare to testing with tens and thousands of dollars worth of audiological equipment? We're here in my clinic in Parkersburg, West Virginia. We're gonna find out. Come on in. So there's some pretty exciting things happening in our industry. Ever since the FDA created their new classification of hearing aid, the over-the-counter hearing aid in 2017, there's been a rush to innovate in this space. The main objective, I believe, is to create accessibility. And um, I think that's just what we're seeing. So what we're doing today is we're evaluating the new Apple AirPod Pro 2 uh, devices and their hearing aid features. We've asked a patient to come down, and that patient is actually my father. My father is a retired audiologist, so he's got some different perspectives than maybe the typical layperson. He's been out of the field for almost 25 years, so he can speak from the perspective of an audiologist, but also from the perspective of somebody who uses this type of technology every single day. Not just for communication, but we've all got one of these in our pockets. You're going to hear those beeps or tones. I just want you to, again, press that button whenever you do. So now, now you have the Did hearing you? aid feature on. Is your heater air on or something? Yeah. That just came in. Now you can go in here and you can change all this stuff. With the ambient noise reduction you're using, my guess is the noise cancellation features of the AirPods to isolate. Right, and, and reduction in low frequency. The technology of the sound processing has improved dramatically. Uh, when it went from analog to digital hearing aids, the, the change was just remarkable for people. And now the testing has improved dramatically as well. So in, in the last 24 years, it's a totally different, totally different profession. Trying not to be biased in it, naturally I feel like when an audiologist is doing the test, they can narrow down the threshold easier by knowing the parameters that they're dealing with. On this test with the phone, they seem to go from high to low to nowhere, and then there was a dead space, and dead space. And it made me feel like I was missing maybe where I should be pushing the button. And then it would come back on and jump to a lower frequency as opposed to a pattern. That's not all bad. You don't want to patternize a, uh, a patient taking the test. You don't want to let them know, you know, a rhythm. Uh, of when to take the test. So that part of it's not bad, but the delay or the, the part where there's uh, an empty space makes you feel a little apprehension uh, as far as taking the test. I, I prefer not to wear something this visible. I would prefer a little BTE with a, with a tube that, uh, that goes in myself. Uh, these make me feel a little occluded. Uh, my voice is a little hollow. I know there's adjustments on there and there's an opportunity to change that. And as I mentioned when we were working on this, I could do this if I was in a particular environment where I was listening for something like uh, hunting for game and, and have a, an, an hour or so that I'd wear these, but I wouldn't want to wear them all day. So let's take an opportunity to run through some pros, some positive things that I noticed while I was using the Apple AirPod Pro 2 hearing aid features, as well as some of the things that I noticed in terms of the testing. So the first thing I noticed is, in general, they're just really easy to use. Anybody who's been around Apple products knows that they really highlight user functionality. And it's something that is, I believe, pretty user friendly and easy to use. So from an accessibility perspective, it's, it's something that is not uncommon. The second thing I notice is just how inexpensive they are. At $249, this is something that 
even if you decided not to use the hearing aid function, is really, really useful in your everyday life. Um, they connect with an Apple product like an iPhone or an iPad, but it just gives you an opportunity to use them for streaming music or taking phone calls and that sort of thing. So from a functionality perspective, they're really handy anyway. When we're talking about the hearing aids though, $249 is an incredibly inexpensive point of entry into exploring options for treating your hearing loss. So I really like that this creates awareness for folks who may otherwise not have explored treatment of the hearing loss. You know, depending on the research that you're reading, the market penetration for traditional hearing aids is about 25 to 27% which, and that's of folks who have hearing loss and they know they have hearing loss. Only 25% of them are treating their hearing loss. So my hope is that with advancements in technology like this, then it will provide an extra opportunity for that other 75% of folks who have hearing loss and are not treating their hearing loss to uh, really get into the weeds on what treatment can mean for them. Next, I noticed just how simple the testing was. Although the testing either defaulted to too noisy in some of our environments or it like timed out. So it stopped the testing and made you restart the testing altogether. Aside from those issues, the testing itself was really straightforward, user friendly, and when listening to it, it wasn't too dissimilar from what a patient would be listening to when we're doing our audiological testing. The app-based testing does a really nice job in not creating a pattern, so people can't easily adapt to what is being presented, so they can't accidentally press the button when they don't hear it. However, I think that it provides enough dead space or quiet space that people may feel that they're not doing something correctly. And so it would be easy to mess up on these. The other thing that I noticed with the testing in terms of a positive is relatively speaking, it was quick. So it certainly takes much less time to run through one of these tests than it would be to uh, perhaps get a referral from a physician, get in your car, drive to a provider, fill out your paperwork, and you know, you know the old routine with going to a new doc. The other thing about testing that I found was incredibly nice to see from an audiologist perspective is that a patient can actually use a hearing test that they've already got. So not only can they take a test through the uh, iPhone itself or through the AirPods, you don't have to use that test. As we found, the accuracy in some cases was a little questionable. So if a patient feels a lot more comfortable using a test that's done by a professional, they can take or scan a photo of that hearing test and upload it into the results. The last thing that I'll talk about that I noticed was, was particularly beneficial is just how adjustable these are. And while prescription hearing aids are certainly adjustable, whether we're using an app or if it's an iPhone, a lot of times there's a native menu in iPhone that you can use to adjust. But what I have found with the Apple AirPod Pro 2s is that whether you're going through the AirPod menu or whether you're using the triple click feature on your iPhone, uh, there's a lot of things that can be adjusted to make the sound quality better. So if you are experiencing um, a hollow sound, you can make some adjustments to try to get rid of that. If you're experiencing too much background noise, there's a lot of technology already built into the AirPods to help with those types of environments, and it's adjustable on there. I found that the ease of use was particularly uh, good, and I think that if you're tech savvy, then this will be a real easy adjustment for you. So now I wanna talk about some cons, some things that I noticed when using these and when testing with them that make me a little bit um, apprehensive about making the recommendation for somebody to use these. As you know, one of the things that we wanted to focus on today is the accuracy of the testing. So we've made some comparisons between um, an audiological evaluation that's conducted in a calibrated booth with calibrated equipment. You know, we're talking to the tune of tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment in some cases as compared to testing on something that you may already have, but the cost of entry is up to about $249 if you already have an iPhone. 
What we found is that the accuracy of the testing just was not quite there. It wasn't exactly the same as what we would get in a booth. It was close. It wasn't as far off, honestly, as I had anticipated. But what we know is if we don't have an accurate assessment, we're not going to have an accurate prescription. And so even though these are not qualified as a prescriptive hearing aid, there still has to be some type of a prescriptive basis that's used based on the hearing assessment. And if the hearing assessment is not accurate, well then we don't have an accurate assessment of what to put into the hearing aids or the AirPods in this case to help somebody communicate by overcoming their hearing loss. I have a clinically diagnosed hearing loss. I've worn hearing aids for about seven years now, but my hearing loss is complex. I have a noise-induced hearing loss from uh, being around a lot of loud sounds and shooting and things like that. And so it's a very specific hearing loss in the high pitches or high frequencies. What that means is that I have pretty normal hearing in most of the other frequencies, but at the high frequencies is where I have some difficulty, and it translates to me not being able to understand speech in background noise. It says that I have little to no hearing loss, and it won't allow me to use the features of the hearing aids in the Apple AirPod Pro 2s. That is a bit confusing when we're talking about over-the-counter hearing aids because it's meant for mild to moderate perceived hearing loss. I perceive difficulty, and I can measure a mild hearing loss, but the Apple products won't allow me to explore the hearing aid features. Similarly, when I did my uh, testing for my father, the Apple software said that one of his ears would qualify for the hearing aid feature, and then the other one did not. And so it only amplified one ear, even though there was a clinical hearing loss in the other ear as well. So it gave him a lopsided effect when listening to the product. Um, I feel that this could potentially create some confusion um, and maybe a little bit of frustration from the consumer who feels that there's an issue, but it's only addressed either in a lopsided way or not at all. One of the other things that I've read quite a bit about um, in some of the blog posts leading up to the release of this product, as well as something that I certainly have noticed myself, is that our society is has kind of been trained to stay away from people with AirPods hanging out of their ears, um, or, or earbuds for that matter. We have, uh, we have developed into a society that when we're traveling <clears throat> or when we're walking in the mall, sometimes we just don't wanna talk to anybody, right? And so we're using these products to stream music or I know people that just hang them in their ears so that people don't talk to them. Well, when we're talking about a communication device, that's a little contraindicated, right? It's a little counterintuitive. I don't wanna to have to start every conversation with, oh no, 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 these are hearing aids, you're not interrupting something, or I'm sorry if this seems rude, but I use these to hear. So that's certainly going to be kind of a societal uh, hurdle that we're gonna to have to jump over if this is going to become something that's mainstream. One of the last points I wanna cover here is the battery life. When we talk about prescriptive hearing aids, something that I would use with my patients in my clinic, the lowest battery life that I'm working with currently is about 16 hours. And in some cases, that's too low. And so a lot of the hearing aids that we're using in our industry now go 24, 30, 50 hours worth of battery life, which means that in five years or so, then we're going to end up with 30 hours. So if we start with 50 hours, and we add time to that battery, then the hope is that in four or five years, that battery life is still significant enough to get that patient through the day. What we're talking about with battery life with the AirPods is about four to six hours, depending on how we're using them. Six hours if we're um, you know, not necessarily doing something that is, is power hungry, but certainly on the lower end, if we are using them for uh, hearing aids or streaming with them or taking phone calls or something like that, the practicality of four to six hours is just not there. I think that uh, what I know about some of my patients who complain about battery life out of something that'll last 12 to 16 hours um, in some cases is what I know is that four to six hours is not going to get somebody through the day and that's going to has the potential to create some frustration. I just have one final thought. 
You know, I think that many people look at this and they think, wow, how far technology has come. Um, what I know about being in the industry is that technology was already here. Prescription hearing aids from any of the major manufacturers, they're going to still be able to connect to your phones via Bluetooth and stream phone calls and stream music and um, have adjustable features and their app-based um, adjustments and things like that. I think the benefit of something like this is, like we've discussed, point of entry. This is truly over-the-counter. It's something that you can buy, $249. The cost of entry is minimal, and it's very, very accessible for many people. I think that this is a really, really great opportunity in our industry to capitalize on just exactly what we're looking at here, which is something that increases accessibility to hearing healthcare more than what we ever imagined a product could. Apple is one of those products that is very, very widespread, very, very successful. Um, and I think that there's gonna be a lot more to come in future iterations of this. However, let's not discount all of the research and development, the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of research and development that has been put into this industry already um, in prescriptive devices. You know, when you go and you purchase a prescription hearing aid, yes, you're probably correct in what you're thinking right now is that they are expensive. You know, four to $6,000 is, is a, quite an investment for a product. But with that product comes professional services, which what we've demonstrated increases the accuracy, not only of the testing, but the accuracy of the prescription as well. I think that it's uh, still very important to work with a professional, even if you're deciding to start with this product uh, as a point of entry into treating your hearing loss. I'm very excited to see where this industry is going to go next. So I hope you found today's video uh, educational, I hope you found it entertaining, and I hope you feel like you learned something. If you have more questions, head on over to askanaudiologist.com or put some comments down below the video and we'll make sure that we get an answer for you um, as quickly as we can. But until next time, see you later. You can find more information at askanaudiologist.com and you can follow us on all our social channels at Ask an Audiologist. The information provided on this podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only and does not substitute for professional medical advice. Oh,